Adventures in the Forgotten Realms has brought us a brand new mechanic called dungeons or venturing or venturing into dungeons. Regardless of what it's called, we are going to see, is it worth it to build this strategy in Commander? That's right. We're going to talk about dungeons, and then we're going to talk about the best enablers for those dungeons being best as the Commander, and then great cards in the 99, and the video starts right now. Special thanks to our Patreon supporters who power our channel. Check out our Patreon for monthly giveaways, exclusive content, and even a starring role in our fanfight series. Link in the description below. Shop at TCG Player using our link in the description below and directly help our channel. Hello and welcome to the day. Thank you for spending your time with us. I'm Jake. I'm Joel. Welcome back to another episode of Jake and Joel are Magic. Jake, I can't believe you didn't say hello and welcome to the dungeon. That is what we're talking about in this video is the dungeon mechanic from Forgotten Realms, Adventures of the Forgotten Realms, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. I'm never going to get this set title. You correct. definitely, you definitely will never get it correct. If you enjoy these videos, click like and subscribe. It's the best way to support the channel with just the click of a button. Joel, there are three dungeons That's from it. Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, and we're going to talk about all of them, right? And then we're going to go through, we're going to talk about the best commanders to utilize these dungeons. And then the best in the 99. What more do we need to go over? Let's get it? it. Let's get it. So leading into our dungeons, we have got three, like Jake said, the Tomb of Annihilation, the Lost Mine of Fandelver, and the Dungeon of the Mad Mage. So with the dungeon mechanic, you need to go look it up yourself to be specific on the exact rules of how this works. But the TLDR, Jake, is that some creatures are going to say venture when you take care of something, like it enters the battlefield, you get to venture, it attacks, you get to venture, something like that. And that's how you either enter the first room or move through the rooms of these dungeons. That's right. And this effect also, like we're going to talk about in this video, may appear on a land or also on an artifact or something like that. And who knows if they continue this in the future, this may appear on different other permanents and card types. Each time you venture through the dungeon, you move one step through. And just like the card looks, you start at the top. You can see the way the arrows work and you move down. Clearly, if you take the left side of the card, it's going to take four steps to complete the dungeon. And if you take the right side, you go Trapped Entry, Oubliette, and then Cradle of the Death God. That's going to take three steps. So it's pretty simple. Each time a card says Venture into the dungeon, you are going to move one step through until you complete it. Tomb of Annihilation is the shortest possible dungeon to complete at three steps. Your three steps being each player loses a life. The next time you venture, you're going to have to discard a card and sack an artifact, a creature, and a land. So huge, huge negative to taking the shortcut here. But the payoff, of which you'll see at the bottom of every dungeon, for this one is create the Atropal, a legendary 4-4 black god horror creature token with death touch. Tomb of Annihilation is the shortest one. It also has special play with a legendary creature called Asaririk, Lord of Unlife, if I'm saying that correctly. I doubt I am. But we'll go through this one more when we talk about the possibilities of the commanders. I just thought it was worth mentioning here when we were talking about the Tomb of Annihilation, it being the shortest but most painful one. Jake, this is the kind of middle one. You can only take four steps in any direction to get this one complete. Your payoff is draw a card. This is the Lost Mine of Fandelver. Yeah, so this starts off with Cave Entrance, which is Scry 1, a pretty basic ability, and then you can take two separate routes. You can either go Goblin Layer, create a 1-1 one, one red goblin creature token, or you can go mine tunnels and create a treasure token. So different strategies here, one a little bit more aggro and the other is, you know, a treasure strategy, possibly ramping out. But then you have three different choices after that. Storeroom, put a 1-1 one, one counter on target creature. Again, something for a counter strategy or some sort of aggro strategy. Then you have dark pool, which is each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So that's going to hit each opponent in EDH. Again, we are talking about these dungeons in EDH application. And then you have fungi cavern, which is target creature gets minus four minus zero until your next turn. And then it ends again, like Joel said, with draw a card. Lost mine of Fandover to me seems like the most middle of the road one it is four steps so it's in between the shortest possible journey and the very long one which is dungeon of the mad mage which we'll look at next and the abilities of this one are kind of all over the place this doesn't scream to me oh this is for aggro decks oh this is for you know control decks it's got a little bit of everything for any deck type that would want it 
That's right. And it ends with velocity, which is simply drawing a card, getting a little bit more through your deck. And again, these cards, they live in the command zone. They're they're kind of like alongside the commander, I guess you could say. Yeah. But they don't live in your sideboard. So like from like modern legacy perspective, any of that, they you just exist. So you don't have to use a sideboard slot for them. Yeah, that's exactly right. Dungeon of the Mad Mage is our longest one. The payoff there at the bottom is pretty sick. Draw three cards and reveal them. You may cast one of them without paying its mana cost, but you're taking seven steps from the entrance to get this complete. The first step, you're gaining a life. Second step, you're scrying one on the dungeon level. Then you can either go for a treasure token or make a creature unable to attack until your next turn. Next up, you're scrying two. Then after that, you can choose either exile the top two cards of your library. You may play them, which is the one that I would be selecting nine times out of ten, probably. Pretty good. Pretty Murals, good. Murals Graveyard, you are creating two one ones, so that's not to be, you know, shaking a stick at if it's an aggro, some sort of, you know, aristocrat's deck that wants things to be sacrificing. After that, you're scrying three, so you get the dungeon level, lost level, deep mind, scry one, two, and three across the life of this thing. And then on your seventh step, shoo, we made it into the Mad Wizard's Lair and you get to cast a card for free. Jake, this one seems very cool and intense, but you've got to be consistently venturing through this dungeon to get this complete. I mean, seven? You don't want this to take seven turns? Right. No, you don't. It, I mean, but again, it is important to keep in mind that these dungeons, they work as a support to whatever your strategy is going to be. If you look at any of these dungeons, none of them have really broken abilities. I mean, the Mad Wizard's Lair is is very, very strong. Exiling the top two of your library, you may play them. This is very strong as well. But again, it just offers support. When you look at some of this other stuff, just scry one, there's, there's nothing that you would really want to be doing in EDH. It's just going to allow you to scry one. You don't want to be sinking any kind of mana in, into that. So that does kind of speak to the fact that these dungeons are just... A little alternative thing that you can run alongside because keep in mind edh strategy you want redundancy you like your strategy to be refined that's the idea with edh is you you're working toward a specific thing and you want to execute that thing so if you start cutting really important cards just so that you can run venture in your deck it's going to make your deck weaker just so that you can venture on through the dungeon of the mad mage and that's what we're ultimately deciding today is it worth it yeah, absolutely. That is the look at the three dungeons that you've got available to choose from. We've got the short one that's a little, you know, kind of self-sacrifice. We've got the middle of the road one that's going to scry, draw cards, create treasure tokens in small quantities. And then you've got the big, huge payoff one here. But Jake, with any of these set only mechanics, the question is, if we're going to run it in commander, do we have the support? Do we have a commander that supports the ability? And do we have enough 99 cards to support the ability as well. Sephiroth of the Hidden Ways is probably, I would think, in our opinion, the best way to get the dungeon mechanic playing in Commander. This was printed in the Commander supplemental product that goes alongside Adventures in the Forgotten Realms. This is not a standard legal card, but you're getting a pretty cool Esper Commander here, a black, a blue, and white for a Human Wizard 2-3. Whenever one or more creature cards are put into your graveyard from anywhere you venture, this ability triggers only once each turn, so you can't go crazy with just sacrificing creatures, creature cards from your graveyard, or, you know, uh, milling them from the top and getting a lot of ventures through. But whenever you complete a dungeon, you get to return a creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Yeah, when you, if you really do want to utilize these dungeons, if you want that to be part of your strategy, then you need a commander that's going to be conducive to that and Sephiroth is a perfect example. You know, we were going through this list and we were like, oh, okay, so it looks like Esper Dungeons is kind of like the way to go. If you really want to have a good dungeon strategy, we're going to see a couple more cards that we're going to talk about that fit in with that Esper, uh, that Esper line. But yeah, Sephiroth, very good. Again, looks like they're dialing it back. You can't have it happen more than once. So you're going to need a little bit of redundancy or it's going to take you a little while to get through the dungeon before you get to those big payoffs at the end. But yeah, definitely a card to consider if you're interested in using the Adventures in the Forgotten Realms dungeons. The reason that we would lean this direction for a single new mechanic from a brand new set is the amount of support that that mechanic has. The set is going to present a certain amount, and that's really all you're going to have access to for getting that keyword of venture into the dungeon so that you can move along these dungeons and trigger your abilities and get stuff done. 
with that you're going to not want to limit yourself to only one color's availability of those keywords because then you're even reducing the available cards that move the mechanic along even further that being right. said we know that Sephiroth is pretty much our pick for this it's obvious it was printed specifically for this and they did a good job with this card i would be excited to play this card with that said we've got some other possibilities if you want to run them as the commander of the 99 for a dungeon deck the first of which is jake i'm gonna take an attempt at this one time before you tell us about this card ace rerak Rerik? i don't know <laughs> lord of unlife one black two other legendary creatures zombie wizard five five when it etbs if you haven't completed tomb of annihilation specifically that first dungeon we talked about return this card <laughs> to its owner's <laughs> hand and venture into the dungeon whenever this card attacks for each opponent create a 2-2 black zombie creature token unless that player sacrifices a creature so a nice little go wide here once you've completed a dungeon again not too difficult to do that certain strategies when you sacrifice things you know that can end up being upside so yeah very strong card here situationally yeah. held back in my opinion by being mono color you know that's going to be one of the biggest detractors you start looking at other mono black generals you know i think about Erebos, which is just a straight up greed right and compared to you know this card i would probably pick that over this but if you are interested in exploring again the dungeons this might be a good way to do it this is a cute card i wouldn't personally say hey go build a mono black dungeon deck with asa rerek as your commander couple of reasons there's no built-in protection on this zombie wizard if we would just want to look at it as a commander when it's attacking you are getting a cool trigger which is created two two unless they sacrifice a creature um and that happens for each opponent that's pretty dope however there's no avoidance there's no trample all they got to do is come up with five power to block this and it's dead um that kind of sucks but it is a small casting cost so it could come back i do like the whole play it for three you're advancing yourself through the dungeons for just three mana every single turn consistently and so i think there's something to be said for the ability just to be moving through the dungeon every single turn but i think jake honestly you and i are both leaning towards this will be a decent card and constructed probably won't make much of a splash as the commander for a dungeon deck yeah let's go ahead and talk about the next legendary that we have this one barrowin of clan under a black a white and two other for a three three dwarf cleric when it enters the battlefield you're venturing into the dungeon which is again entering or moving into the next room whenever it attacks you get to return up to one creature card with mana value three or less from your graveyard to the battlefield if you've completed a dungeon so we've got ace Rerak kind of acting like a grave titan if you've completed a dungeon arrow when we've kind of got a sun titan if you've completed a dungeon yeah sun titan for creatures it's not going to be non-land permanent but very strong card here and i definitely think that this is one of the cards that needs to be run in the 99 if you pick Sephiroth, you should absolutely 1 million percent have this card in the 99 this is just going to help where Sephiroth only is able to venture through the dungeon once per turn Barrowin is going to allow you to do that and again we do have a couple more cards that are going to work really well in the 99 but this is is kind of on like the low end we have one more card that's going to possibly work as a commander in the deck but this is a little bit more medium but also one of these cards that by itself printed on the card is going to get you through the dungeon no other cards needed yeah, if you can flicker it. That's really right. what it comes down to. If Barrowin said enters the battlefield or attacks, I would be much higher on this as a secondary option to Sephiroth for a commander of a deck like this. Sure, sure. But ETB, you are in the right colors for blinking it so that you can get the ETB over and over again. But I would prefer if we could also trigger it on the attack is pretty much what that one comes down to. Jake, you alluded to it. Varus Silvery Moon Ranger is the other one that we've sort of identified as... Eh, this is a possibility. This one's on the bench for being the commander of a dungeon deck. You just you end up narrowing yourself into just green. Yeah, that's right. And when you start going into mono green, you start thinking about cards like, I don't know, Thrun. You start thinking about big green Omnath. creatures. Yeah, exactly. And then all of a sudden you're like, okay, well, this card is outclassed rather quickly. However it does by itself get you through the dungeon so if this is something that you want to explore this might be a fun casual card for you to bring to your edh table 
again whenever you cast a creature or planeswalker spell venture into the dungeon so this is a pretty big deal you know green is pretty much known for creature cards so this card by itself if you have a handful of creatures you could just play this dump stuff on the battlefield and get through the dungeon rather quickly and then whenever you complete a dungeon create a 2-2 green wolf creature token if you have any token doublers any kind of parallel lives type thing or any kind of doubling season obviously it gets better it has a little bit of reach a little bit of ward action for protection but yeah all in all the converted is probably the best on this uh, best part of this card as you're going to be able to cast it a lot yeah, I mean, the green cards haven't really risen to the top in our exploration of the dungeon mechanic so far. Varus was included in our four options for commanders just because it represents a different color than the mechanic sort of lives in, which is kind of cool. And it comes at it from a different direction, being creature and planeswalker spell cast triggers moving you through. However, I would say play Sephiroth, put Asa Serac, whatever, whatever, whatever it is, into the 99, put Barrow into the 99. Don't worry about Varus and Commander. But Jake, what else can we put into the 99? Oh. I think we can put Nadar Selfless Paladin. This is maybe one of the best 99 cards for this and arguably possibly a dungeon commander, but again, just run Sephiroth. Yeah, one white, two other for a three, three Vigi. Whenever uh, Nadar enters the battlefield or attacks, venture into the dungeon. So pretty it's sweet, got what like I you were talking Barrowin about earlier. Have right it has that attack trigger as well uh other creatures you control get plus one plus one as long as you've completed a dungeon so a nice little anthem if you've gotten through a dungeon on this card and again that vigilance is really nice um yeah definitely a card for the 99 in my opinion and i i mentioned this to joel as well but say you're interested in these dungeons you have a really good strategy but maybe you know you have a nice blink engine in your deck something where you go infinite with like a dead eye or something like that then you could have a, a dungeon just in your sideboard or not in your sideboard, but in your command zone, right? Where you could just be degenerate with the dar just to complete a dungeon. For example, this doesn't only happen once each turn. This is the kind of thing where if you blink this enough, you could just complete a dungeon in one turn if you have enough mana to do it. Yeah, I love that about it. It's fantastic. I do wish that the Anthem stacked. I wish that more of these abilities stacked. A lot of them say they give you this thing if you've completed a dungeon and it's sort of just like, you know, City's Blessing from Ixalan where it checks once, if you have it, you've got it, and then you just have it for the rest of the game. I think the Nadar would be super cool if it was plus one, plus one for each time you've completed a dungeon to sort of represent leveling up in D&D. &D. But regardless, I definitely think Nadar belongs in the 99. Here's a green one. I know we're talking about playing Sephiroth, but we wanted to mention this because it is very strong if you need green support for dungeon, and that is Eliwick Tumblestrom. It's that top ability, right? Plus one venture into the dungeon. That's exactly what you're looking for here. You can do it every turn. It's automatic. It's plus on the Planeswalker. Past that, gets a little generic green Planeswalker-y for me. Look at the top six cards of your library. You can reveal a creature card, put it into your hand. If it's legendary, you gain three life. And then minus seven, you get an emblem of creatures you control, have trample and haste and get plus two, plus two for each differently named dungeon you've completed. So potentially up to plus six, plus six. That's pretty cool. Yeah, this is, again, one of those cards that enters the battlefield and it's plus one essentially just takes you through the different dungeons. So there's a lot of versatility that comes with this card in a certain way, right? If this is in your 99, you have the three dungeons that are just in your command zone. Depending on what you're playing against, you can kind of ana analyze that in the moment and come up with a different strategy. If you have creatures to protect Eliwick, then this card is definitely going to be a threat that your opponents are going to need to answer because depending on the situation, you can pick what dungeon you need to go through with this card. And that plus one is really nice because unless they answer this, it's just going to get bigger and bigger until you ultimately go off with that emblem. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Jake, I think next up we've got what is my favorite card as support for dungeons, and that's Triumphant Adventurer. Yeah, one black, one other for a 1-1 one, one death touch. Human Knight, as long as it's your turn, uh, Triumphant Adventurer has first strike, and whenever Triumphant Adventurer attacks, venture into the dungeon. First strike, death touch, baby. So that's, good. That's it, man. That's what makes it good. No, You know, enough said. That's yeah. exactly what you want in a deck like this. Alongside cards like this, Jake Hamar Pashar, excuse me, not very good at the pronunciation. She's a rune seeker. 
And uh, she makes the room abilities of dungeons you own trigger an additional time. That's a pretty sick ability to have as support. Yeah, exactly. This is a perfect card for the 99. Again, you know, if you made this your commander, pretty lackluster. So definitely a 99 here. But yes, all anything that says scry one, you're going to scry an additional time. Anything that says scry two, you're going to scry an additional time. If you get something that returns something to from the graveyard to the battlefield, it's going to happen an additional time. It's a perfect addition for the 99. Hey, Hama, Hama Pashar on the battlefield. You complete Dungeon of the Old Mage, Dungeon of the Mad Mage. Draw three cards, reveal them. You may cast one of them without paying its mana cost. You get to do that twice. Just putting that out there seems pretty good. Another blue creature, Jake. This snake rogue is pretty excellent in the 99. Yes. Just a 2-1 can't be blocked as long as it's attacking alone. I mean, what more do you want? Uh, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, venture into the dungeon. So it has everything built into it. Is it easy to kill? Does it die to shock? Does it die to pestilence? Does it die to wrath of God and a hundred sure. other spells in, in commander? It absolutely does. But if you're trying to venture through the dungeon, you want a repeatable way to do that. You want a creature that has some built-in protection that's going to require just more than a, you know, a chump blocker. Then yeah, that's the way to go. And then finally, two red and three other for Zalto fire giant duke yeah three subtitles after that first name loving that whenever it's dealt damage you get to venture this is a pretty interesting one it comes at it from more of like an attacking abrasive side you want to be punching in with this and eventually you know seven is a significant chunk of damage they're gonna need to be blocking and that's gonna get you through the dungeon i don't think this is very good it's not even in the esper color scheme that sort of has been representing the best dungeon delving cards to us but wanted to mention it because it is relevant with that keyword and that's kind of what it goes back to like we said at the beginning of the video when you start making these specific set brand new mechanic edh decks you're sort of at the mercy of what's available past the creatures though we do have two other cards we wanted to mention one of which is the land the rare land that has to do with the mechanic from the set we've got dungeon descent enters the battlefield tapped you could tap it to add one wastes or for four you can tap dungeon descent and tap and untap legendary creature you control and venture into the dungeon activate only as a sorcery so an expensive way of venturing through the dungeon a clunky way to say the least of venturing through the dungeon however it does venture through the dungeon and this is an ability that is on a land so we like an edh when we're able to put weird abilities on lands it allows us to not have to put that in one of our spell slots of the deck yeah, that's true. Or it gives us just residual stuff to do when we've run out of steam. Having right. abilities on land, we can activate those. Jake said it. This is so clunky, y'all. Four. First of all, it's four. Then you have to also tap it with a legendary creature you control. It only does it once, and it can only be sorcery speed. It's just... It's kind of bad, to be honest. This did not need to enter the battlefield tapped. Right! It's, let's just dude. say that this land 1 million percent did not need to enter the battlefield tapped i 100 percent agree there's nothing on any of these dungeons that this land would give you access to that turn that is that bad especially when you also have to jump through the hoop of four mana have an untapped legendary creature you control on the battlefield it's just too much this yeah, card is not that good let it enter the battlefield tapped and then that tap and untap legendary creature you control that should be just like a one cost or even a zero cost ability. Right. Like yeah. that, that ability could literally just say tap and tap and untap legendary creature you control venture into the dungeon activate only as a sorcery. That did not need to cost four. This does not have the potency of a Karn's Bastion. Let's just say that. Like, right. It doesn't proliferate everything on your board. It's just going to most likely let you scry two or something like it's, it's not great. A lot of times when they print these mechanics, brand new mechanics into sets like this, there is at least one rare land that has to do with it. So we wanted to mention it, even if it's bad, you should probably run this in your venture into the dungeon deck just because it is redundancy on that ability. And that's what EDH is about once you've picked your strategy. Jake, we've also got the dungeon map. It's a three cost artifact. It's a rock. It taps for one waste. You also can pay three, tap it to venture into the dungeon, activate only as a sorcery. Why is this uncommon 
artifact better at doing what the rare land is doing just because the land doesn't cost three to enter i guess that's probably the best way that we could describe it but again you're looking at redundancy uh this is the dungeon map this is the dungeon map from adventures in forgotten realms we've talked about some of the best cards today let us know if you think there are any that we have missed if you are going on an adventure make sure to bring everything that you need don't get in a situation where you have to you know do what aaron ralston did in 127 hours and cut off your arm because you didn't tell anybody where you were going do you think before he left for his journey anybody was like hey you really should take an extra pair of dry socks and then he got into that situation and he was like ha, they thought socks was gonna help that would be a funny like moment of irony to like think back on as your hand is caught under a boulder like that would be yeah. like a nice 30 seconds of just like fantasy Should've brought land some socks! <laughs> <laughs> right yeah exactly anyway you found the good content of this video thanks for sticking around to the end bye